Okay, so we are now live for our seven o'clock workshop. Um, this is a workshop on the Kiwanis International Youth Protection Policies, um, including some important updates that have come out from Kiwanis International this year. Um, so tonight's presenters are Brian Morrison, who is our District Youth Protection Manager, and <coughs> Melissa McMahon, who is the Youth Protection Guru at Kiwanis International. I can't remember her exact title, so hopefully Guru is, uh, is good enough. Um, so with that, I will let our presenters take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will let Melissa do uh, the bulk of it since she is the guru. Uh, and I know we just had some new updates. Uh, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to join that meeting. But uh, I will say I am the New England and Bermuda District um, Youth and Protection Officer. So you can always come to me if you need anything. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Melissa, as we know, McMahon, nice to see you again. And uh, you've been wonderful since you've taken over. Uh, so I, I appreciate all your hard work at this and thanks for keeping us all up to date. So without further ado, I'll introduce Melissa McMahon from Kiwanis International. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Will. I appreciate it very much. Um, so before we get started, I would love to gauge the audience and see if you could put in the chat, how many of you are advisors? How many of you are, if you're a key club advisor or a builders club advisor, um, the bulk of what I'm going to be talking about today, um, I'm gonna use acronyms like SLP. And when I say SLP, those are the service leadership programs. So that's also the, the Kiwanis youth programs as well as action club and CKI. So I would love to hear from you in the chat if you are able to. Um, anyone who is a Key Club advisor. Oh, Don, that's great. Um, and also, as you um, feel free to ask questions in the chat as we go along. And I will try and kind of uh, keep an eye out for those. And then Will and Brian can help moderate those at the end um, and help me if I miss anything, um, if we don't go back to it or if we get a string of emails. So. Larry is Key Club Advisor. Welcome. Great. This will be great information for, for all of you who are advisors and then all of you who work with, um, with youth. Um, so to tell you a little bit about myself, um, my title is actually Youth Protection Specialist. I've been with the Kiwanis family since January. And prior to that, I worked um, with the state of Indiana, um, Health and Human Services, Criminal Justice, Child Welfare, in policy programs and grants management. Um, I have a long extensive in um, child abuse um, prevention, local, state, and national nonprofits that I've done a lot of work with. Um, prior to me coming on board, Michelle Sudi Campbell, she was the first youth protection manager, and now she's been promoted to the Kiwanis Youth Programs. And I keep her picture in here because typically we, um, we kind of bounce off each other and we sometimes present together. So just to give you resources at the Kiwanis International level. So why does youth protection matter? Uh, if you're not aware that Kiwanis International, we actually serve around 300,000 students in our, that are members of our programs. Um, and that's not to mention the youth that, are, that we serve in our community projects. Um, and our service projects. So we are entrusted for those youth that are in our service or in our Kiwanis youth programs where and some of the youth that are in our programs. And, and also let me know if my internet is unstable or if I get, will just send me a message or something. I just had a message pop up, so I apologize. Yeah, we did, we did, you did just break up for a couple sentences there. Okay, I'll go back. Um, so talking about abuse, we know that globally one in four of the youth will suffer some type of abuse. Um, I think the statistics are one in six young girls, one in four, or one in six young boys, one in four young women um, may suffer some type of sexual abuse. And from the research that we've done, we 
have seen that um, typically abuse is at the hands of someone that children know, um, not always a stranger. And we also recognize that um, that children often don't report the abuse, um, either out of fear or not knowing who to go to. Um, and globally, um, the child abuse and violence to youth, it costs a lot of money in, um, in the recovery of that. And um, it can be an economic burden um, in all different ways. And as we look to Generation Z, so I'm not no know if you're familiar, but that um, the generation that are currently in um, elementary, middle school, high school, they're actually now Generation Z. They're no longer the millennials. Um, and there was a recent study in 2018 from the American Psychology Association um, and looking at what are the stressors um, for, um, for this new generation. And they are the most anxious, stressed out generation. And um, unfortunately, um, suicide is very is prevalent. It's the third leading cause in the deaths of 18 to 29 year olds. So, as we're working with these youth in the youth in the youth programs, not only do we want to protect them from predators or abuse, we also um, have instituted some new initiatives related to culture of care and and mental health. And so, we'll talk about those in a little bit. So our goals with youth protection are that we are protecting our young members, our youth members from predators. We're also empowering and educating those adults who are working with the youth. And then also providing the youth with positive skills development tools um, because they're our future leaders and we're teaching them in fellowship and in service and in their community how they can be um, leaders. And just to kind of go back to the, the suicide, um, unfortunately, um, at the higher levels, at the key club level and the CKI level, um, at the, the international board has actually received um, different peers that have self-reported, self-reported harm, self-reported um, different abuse. And so one of, one of the things that is coming out of that, out of that feedback that our, our international leaders have heard um, is that we want to equip the students. We're not asking them to be counselors. Um, we just want them to know where the resources are. So a lot of this presentation and this training is so that you as advisors, you working in the community with the youth, um, that you have resources available to you. Um, so wanted to start out with talking about um, our background check compliance and our advisors and also our youth protection annual training. So I'm going to get into the policy piece in a few minutes, um, but all of our uh, service leadership pro program advisors are required to have a background check. And here are some numbers of the North American SLPs. Um, their background check process is a little bit different for non-US um, on in some of the other districts. So this these numbers are primarily for that. And we have approximately close to 9,000 different SLP clubs across North America. And of those, we have close to 7,000 advisors on record. Uh, these are Kiwanis members who are serving as advisors. Um, the, the difference in that, that number is that there's also typically a faculty member who is a faculty person who also serves as an advisor. And then in some places, there may not be a sponsoring Kiwanis Club. Um, but approximately 5,000 of those advisors are background check. So that kind of puts our number at a Kiwanis advisors that do have a Kiwanis background check at 73%. And you may be asking, why isn't this 100? Well, I will say um, that 73% is making strides in where we were from a year ago um, with youth protection and also the background check um, statistics. So kudos to everything that everyone's been doing to reach out to um, our advisors and making sure that they're current with the background check. I did, let's see, yes. 
okay, North America. And then this is a little bit different. So I went ahead and I broke out um, New England Bermuda District, your SLPs. So I took that big number and then I looked at that um, little number. So you actually have 97% of your SLPs are sponsored by a Kiwanis Club. So kudos to you. You are definitely um, doing a great job in sponsoring those builders clubs, those key clubs. And then of those in our membership. So, Melissa, so does that mean that the KI sponsored SLPs is really 254, not 154? To get to the yes. 97? Yes. Thank you. Not 154. Fix that when we send it to y'all. Yes. Sorry. I will fix that. Yes. Because I was like, because when I did that, I was like, that's a great number. Thank you for catching that. Um, and then you have 211 advisors on record. So that is really great that you are keeping up with your records and that most of your clubs, um, the, the high percentage, 81%, um, there is a Kiwanis advisor on record and that 66% of those advisors have a background check on record. And then the annual training, that is gonna be the youth protection guideline trainings that at the club level, um, the clubs are reviewing policies and procedures. So that's at a 34%. Um, and then I broke it down even more. So for those- Wait, Melissa, can you go back real quick? Sure. Um, so let's just look at these percentages though. So. While you guys have one of the highest percentages of um, all of SLPs being sponsored by your Kiwanis Club, and that 81% of KI that we know where your KI advisors are, when you drop down to that 66%, you guys are not, um, you're lagging a little bit behind that average where we are. And uh, we're gonna talk about some strategies where we can help you boost that and what we have seen really successful in other districts. So background noise. It's dinner time here and people are a little rambunctious. No, that's fine. And this is uh, Michelle Studi Campbell, who I showed her picture um, a, a little bit earlier. Sorry, Michelle, I didn't see you on or I would have let you introduce yourself. I apologize. I was tardy. <laughs> um, so I also broke down um, the numbers per each of the program lines. So for Key Club, CKI, Builders, K-Kids, and Action Club. And, um, and the numbers, so you can see it a little bit more um, specific for the different areas. So as I said, our goal is for 100% of all our advisors to meet that youth protection compliance. And um, one thing um, we have reached out recently, so on a monthly basis, we send those advisors who do not have a background check um, currently in our system, we send them a reminder um, to get that done. We also, um, the board of directors in February passed a, a due date and recently in July, the international trustees have um, extended that to September 1st. So we're asking that all of the advisors, if they don't have a background check already, that they get that completed by September 1st, or unfortunately they will be dropped from our membership or from our advisor role until they complete that. And I have already sent to, um, I'm pretty sure, hopefully Brian was included on that email, um, but also the Brian, the governor, um, and it may, I wanna say maybe 30 or 40 names. It's not, um, it's not all of your clubs. It's just um, a certain amount. And typically what we're finding is that it's um, folks who, maybe already get a background check through their school and they don't wanna get a background check through Kiwanis, they think it's duplicate um, or that they um, also maybe don't have the right email and up-to-date information in our membership system. So that's one of the reasons that we reached out to the district leadership level just to double check, do we have the right person um, in our system that is the key club advisor or a builder's club advisor for particular clubs? And I think what's a particular challenge with this district is that Caribbean Bermuda piece. Um, and so I think that um, with the youth club there, we can really help um, those folks. There seems to be um, a little confusion about the forms and what's needed. Um, to be honest, background checks are really very much a United States thing, but safe hiring solutions can work with all of the um, 
countries where we have SLPs, and we do know that while it may sometimes take a little longer in um, the Caribbean nations, that they we have some workarounds. I, I know last year in some of the countries it was cost prohibitive. Um, so whereas here in the United States, background um, checks. This is my daughter Rosemary Catherine. Um, Um, we're trying to get back on a school routine. We're maybe not doing the best, um, but we're working on it. So, um, sorry, what we did go ahead and do last year is extend that $25 rate um, to all SLP advisors. Um, even if you're in a country, and I think Bermuda might be one of them, where it's $300 for a background check, we don't charge that. It's 25, we eat the rest of that. Um, so we wanna make sure that people realize that and are not um, put off or um, discouraged about getting a background check due to the cost. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so now we're gonna kind of go into youth protection progress and just highlight um, some of the things that the youth protection team has been doing in the last few months. Uh, so in May, uh, besides just do, doing a Lieutenant Governor District, we also worked with the key club in the CKI, the governor's training. Uh, we trained advisors and uh, advisors and administrators. Uh, and then we also worked with getting chaperones um, background checked for the key club in the CKI senior night. That was one of the things. And then there are some recorded um, and you all may have seen this already, um, but at the Kiwanis International, they put together a um, kind of a menu option of some workshops that different decons, if they wanted to, to use. But I did do a virtual um, youth protection training. Um, it's only 20 minutes. It's a shortened version from this, from this um, particular one. And then also one on virtual meetings. So if you wanna go out there and look at those, um, you can. Also in July, we trained over 100 different um, advisors, district administrators, and also club leaders at the Key Club International Summer Leadership Conference, as well as the CKI Next, the virtual conference. Uh, we had youth protection trainings. And then we also just recently rolled out a, um, a new report for our youth protection uh, managers, uh, our different officers, on um, keeping track of the Kiwanis by, by district, by club, of who is meeting that requirement of having that annual training for youth protection guidelines. And then kind of hitting on the Summer Leadership Conference, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the culture of care, but wanted to kind of introduce it here. This is some progress that we've made, uh, something that really great so as part of the Key Club Summer Leadership Conference that we held this year um, virtually, we partnered with the Indiana, um, the Indiana Coalition to End Sexual Assault and Human Trafficking. Burton Patterson actually presented workshops last year at the Key Club International Convention, but this year um, he presented four different workshops. And those were, we were so excited to have such high numbers. We had 536 students who actually not only registered, but they attended the, are you talking to me, effective peer communication. So building a culture of care, we, is kind of our focus on youth protecting youth. And as I mentioned about youth creating um, an environment of empathy and we want the advisors and the adults that are working with them to not only looking at the, the fellowship and the leadership, but also just caring um, about youth as well. Um, but we are really excited about the, um, the feedback that we received. This, these were the highest uh, registration for the, the selection of workshops and the students wanted more information on the topics as well. Um, in August, as I mentioned, we did do a, a outreach to our SLP um, advisors as well as district media or district membership. Um, we've also done board trainings. Um, the new members of the International Key Club and CKI boards, we have done um, youth protection training 
and kind of focused it more on the youth and like talking about social media and transportation and those things that would apply to the youth. And then um, we also have a blog post and some social media posts that are coming out to present, um, talk about our helpline. And then coming up in September and October, we have our Youth Protection Week. Um, so the first week of October is going to be Youth Protection Awareness Week. And this week is dedicated to promoting uh, clubs to complete their youth protection training, do a review of their annual, uh, annual policies and procedures. But as well, we're offering a variety of different webinars for different audiences. So whether it's a local club, whether um, on Thursday, if anyone has questions background check related um, with our Safe Hiring Solutions partner. Um, we also are working on getting a youth bullying prevention webinar set up. We've, we're in the talks with a couple different um, national programs. And then also for club secretaries, uh, there's been some enhancements and some updates to the secretary dashboard that I want to share to some of the club secretaries and how they can help with reporting and initiating background checks. So be sure to put that on your calendar. So now we're going to break it down into the youth protection ABCs and talk a little bit more about policy and procedures um, at that big kind of global level. So we've broken down our youth protection um, and it's multifaceted, multi-tenants, and we've broken it down into A, accessible and high quality training, B, the background checks and beyond, and then C, culture of care. So that education piece that I mentioned about the policies and procedures, you can find this document on our kiwanas.org youth protection website. Um, it's just three pages. And it basically, it breaks it down to those policies that are applicable to those youth programs. Um, and also with education, oh, go ahead, Michelle, did you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to tie this back to that percentage. I think you all are at 34%-ish or so of people who have completed the youth protection training. Every year, that resets on October 1st. And that is not going through an hour-long presidium course it's not sitting through an extra long webinar. It is literally being in your club meeting when the youth protection hand overview is read. And so I think we're gonna um, spend some additional time and communication with the club secretaries and the district secretaries, because really, I misspoke. It's not even as hard as sitting in the room when that's read. It's just making sure somebody in your committee reads it. And then the secretary ticks the box that says they've read it. And I, and I, yeah, and I think it's just a matter of, yeah, making sure that the, the box is checked and where that is. And so that's going to be part of one of the, the secretary dashboard websites or webinars. Yeah. So even if you're not there, everyone in the club <laughs> will credit. It's <laughs> the do, best class ever. <laughs> but we do want to make sure that everyone who is working with oh, you, yeah. they read, that they read it. So, of course, but... <laughs> Um, so one of the updates that, um, so in February, the KI International Trustees, um, your club or your district actually, we worked with Will and um, New England District um, had background checks done on the chaperones that were going to the key club district. So you guys were already ahead of the game, but some districts didn't, didn't have um, all their chaperones background checked at the district level. We required it at the key at the key club international conference. So this was a new um, update that for the policy that all chaperones um, need to have a background check if they're participating in a single day event off school premises. So typically faculty advisors, they have a background check um, and that's covered during the school. But if someone is going to be a chaperone, a mom, another key club member, maybe the treasurer of your key club or treasurer of your Kiwanis club, and they're not typically um, working with youth, but they're gonna go to this conference, um, we ask them that they get a background check prior to that event. And then also, as always, this hasn't changed that chaperones um, must be 21 years of older. So this applies to the CKI students. So CKI students, 
we talk to them in those trainings that they need to be 21 years or older if they're going to be responsible for a group of youth. Um, and as well as completing the protection, youth protection training, review of the policies and procedures. And also there needs to be a minimum for chaperones, a minimum of one adult per 10 students. And that requirement may be met if there is an advisor already there. This is just looking at those additional adults um, chaperones. So kind of going along with that, our policy uh, for adult chaperones, so it must be one adult male for 10 males or up to 10 males, and then one adult female for up to 10 um, female youth who are participating in um, an overnight event, participating in an off school premises type event. Reporting guidelines. So if anyone um, hears of or is observes any troubling behavior of a uh, youth, we ask that they report to the personnel on site. So that might be the, the conference coordinator. That might be the DA of a particular, if it's a builder's club or a key club event. Um, and also if it's urgent or if it's against the law, then we definitely ask you to um, report to law enforcement as it's appropriate. And then if you become aware of something um, after an event, again, we still contact the leaders of the event, provide notification to law enforcement if that's appropriate, say there was underage drinking at a, at a district convention, um, and we want all, you know, just as a reminder of all local, state, provincial, and federal laws that those must be followed. And then social media and communication. So the best bet in working with youth when it comes to social media uh, is not liking, friending the individual use on an individual basis, their individual pages. So that if you are a key club advisor, you're working with them on that key club page, or say you're at the district level and you're a district governor, you're a district secretary, you're communicating with them from the, the district page to a key club page, not necessarily one-on-one. -on -one. And part of that is just not to, to hinder or to um, prevent um, not having a, a relationship, but it's more about making sure that it's public facing, that it's professional as possible, and that, um, that we're treating all posts so that there isn't that privacy or um, that there's access, that there's public access, that kind of thing. Um, another rule that we, best practice that we recommend is the rule of three. So avoiding one-on-one -on -one text, one-on-one -on -one emails. So say you are uh, a club president at a local club and you want to invite the local key club members to participate in a fundraiser event, including another adult from your club, including their advisor, like just making sure that there's more than one adult. Um, and even Brian, like as your district youth protection officer, include him on there. Say you don't necessarily know, you don't have a faculty advisor, you know, include Brian. He is a great resource. And um, as far as, you know, being able to, if you guys have any questions about these policies and procedures, like later on um, down the road, when you're actually maybe in an incident, you know, reach out to myself, reach out to Michelle, reach out to Brian. So here is a scenario. Um, and this is just kind of applicable um, application, just to kind of walk through. So Pat is a new college grad and a former key club youth leader. And Pat is a member of the local Kiwanis Club and will be a key club advisor. Pat is also a communications marketing professional. Pat is very enthusiastic of her new role and Pat friends the faculty and students in the club on Facebook. Pat posts pictures of the first meeting on Facebook, Instagram, and even creates a new key club Snapchat filter. If you're not familiar with that, that's just an app. So what do you do? Does anybody have any ideas? And I guess I didn't mention, um, we'll talk about that. I'll just go ahead and move it on. It all depends. So if Pat has appropriate permissions and waivers from the school, from the guardians um, to post and is using the club's page, then that's okay. 
But if Pat is using their own page, then it's not okay. And one thing that I um, I didn't highlight at the last um, the last slide was not posting of youth's picture. So typically you might see youth with their like their youth picture if they have appropriate photo release. So on our website, the Key Club website, there's photo release waivers that as long as the parents have signed them, then it's okay. Otherwise, just a general picture of students. Um, we just want to be careful that we want to make sure that ex expressed consent is given. And looking at our transportation policy. So a best practice is a rule of three in a car, um, students riding in the back seat. And again, making sure that you have the approval from the school, approval from um, the parents, the guardian, following all local, um, local policy. Uh, one thing that we, another best practice that we recommend is a travel log. So keeping track of um, when you've dropped off students, when you haven't, um, who's all in the car, just for, you know, record keeping. It's not mandatory, but it's definitely um, something that, you know, would definitely help in a situation where there might um, be a question or something rise up later about questionable behavior, whether the student or even the adult. Um, medication. So our policy is that any possession of medication or um, non-prescription medication, Tylenol, Advil, should only be allowed if written permission from a parent or guardian. So if they're going to that overnight decon at a different city, um, a district convention for Key Club, then they need to have a parent's written permission. And then Presidium training. And thank you, um, for asking about the Presidium training. So the Presidium training is a new, um, a new training that we released in February. So after months of working on, with Presidium, they are actually a provider of training and a researcher and different models of prevent, child abuse prevention. They have a learning portal. And so we have partnered with them and this uh, screenshot is just basically some of the different types of courses. They're 15, 20 minute modules and depending on um, your role, uh, all SLP advisors are required um, to complete these trainings and depending on your role, whether you're a chaperone um, or if you're just a member, um, it, there's a different number and once these are completed, it's good for two years. And chaperones are also um, required to complete the chaperone portion. So those are only three different um, modules. And I do have, if someone is interested, if they um, say you're the club secretary or club treasurer, and you're interested in what is this presidium training, um, again, the training modules are more on the broader scope of child abuse, um, sexual predators, re mandatory reporting, not as much the KI policy on social media. More of the broad base in working with youth. Um, so <clears throat> this is the Kiwanis Connect, the member portal. And for your um, personal page, if you were to log into the, the portal and you can click on this create Presidium account. And so we've opened it up to any Kiwanis member who would like to take the training. The trainings are free. And you just click on that and you will get an email sent. For, for those of you who... Never mind. This is exactly what I think Curtis and a couple other people in the chat want to know is where can they access the training? Yes. This is perfect. Yes. So um, you can, if you are already advisor, so in February, we set up all the advisors, all the district youth protection managers, all the, di the district administrators for all the levels of the SLPs. Um, you can um, find out what your password and your login, it can be resent to you. You can either email me at youthprotection at kiwanis.org or you can email or call Presidium. And I'm happy to share these slides afterwards so that you'll have these and I'll give these to Will so that he can distribute them um, for you as well. So we kind of, we talked about background checks already, but this is just a policy. Go ahead. 
Michelle, so I do want to talk a little bit. I don't, um, so sorry, I was on vacation last week, so I don't have Melissa's updated slides memorized, but Melissa, are we going to talk a little bit about the strategy that they've employed in Capitol and a couple other Rocky Mountain districts and so forth where they're, they're edging in on 90, 90 plus percentage on the background che checks and how they've uh, gotten that success? Sure, we can. So, um, so some of the places that we've heard from some of the youth protection managers that have that higher 90%, um, they have been taking, so we send out compliance reports, to youth protection um, managers, and looking at those and then actually sharing them with lieutenant governors and breaking those lists down to smaller chunks. And then the lieutenant governors have been the ones, um, lieutenant governors or even secretaries reaching out and looking at the list of advisors who don't have a background check and just making sure that those, um, that the rosters are updated or that our system um, has the most recent email address and so forth. Yeah, so I think like the greatest power of relationships and the friends and connections that we make in Kiwanis are really at those um, kind of like a local level. And so while we certainly have connections and know folks at a district level or international level, kind of that down to those um, those divisions and those lieutenant governor areas um, have real connections and deeper connections and they can ask like so what's the hesitancy why are you uncomfortable or whatnot and people feel like they're more able to disclose about concerns about data privacy and those pieces um, may not feel comfortable certainly telling Melissa or I or maybe even Will, although he's lovely. Everybody talks to Will. Um, so they have found real success um, in districts all over um, kind of North America with that. And so um, if you're able, if that's something in your district that you're comfortable doing or want to, you know, pilot in a couple um, divisions that may have a higher um, number of non-compliant advisors, you know, we'd be happy to connect uh, Brian and Will with those districts that have employed this and had great success. And I would also say that we heard recently that some of the districts have included um, making sure they have the background check and the training done as part of their distinguished, um, distinguished yes. di club or district. So, yes. We love um, awards. <laughs> um, so again, as Michelle just kind of um, brought up, we, we have partnered with Safe Visitor Safe Hiring Solutions. And the background checks is not new. I just recently found out that we've been uh, partnering with Safe Visitor and Safe Hiring Solutions since 2008. So, um, and for the US and the Caribbean searches, that's who we use. For Canadian, we actually, here I'll go back. Um, we are, we ask that um, Canadian members go to their local police service and submit that. And so I do know that um, the Bermuda that we have received um, Bermuda background checks and when our safe hiring, they just look at the different kinds of documentation. So um, in Bermuda, they may not have a social security number. So they may have different types of documentation like a passport versus what we would use for a social security card, that kind of thing. But um, Safe Hiring Solution actually has researchers in different countries that actually do the legwork and they work with the governments. So, um, and if you are someone who you're not sure if I have a background check or is it still in effect or is it expired, you know, that two years, again, you can go to your Honest Connect member portal. And if you click on where it says the little eye icon background checks for the US members, um, you'll be sent a link um, for those in Bermuda or um, non-US, you'll need to contact the background checks and then we have a different link um, that we actually send directly to you. It's a little bit different. Um, I put in here, I'm at 740, so I might go a little bit faster, I apologize, but um, just wanted to hit on, again, background checks with faculty advisors as well as um, when we talk about faculty advisors, their background check is good that they have through the school when they're on the school school grounds. But as soon as they become a chaperone and they're coming to Key Club International Convention in Disney, then we need them to have a Kiwanis 
background check and uh, primarily for liability purposes. So that's one of um, the, these are just different scenarios that we've provided to kind of give you a little bit more information. Um, and again, when we talk about um, official chaperone, that would be, you know, responsible for those 10 kids. If you're someone who is just going to an event and you're not necessarily responsible for um, lunch check-ins, dinner check-ins, or, or bed checks, then that's a that's a different scenario, and you don't you don't need a a background check for that. Um, so here is another scenario. So your Key Club Decon is coming up in just five days, and you have fifty chaperones. 45 have cleared and five are pending. What do you do? So the chaperones, they must pass the Kiwanis background check, um, giving your volunteers a deadline of no less than four weeks, um, depending on the background check. Unfortunately, during COVID, we saw um, many of the co uh, courts closed down. And so it took a little bit longer but background checks can take anywhere from 24 hours to three to four weeks. And then also, if you're short on chaperones, work with your district, um, work with your DAs, work with your youth protection manager to see if um, there are others who already have a cleared background check that they can help fill in with that. With that. Manager, they all have background checks. Every district has one. Yes. Use them. Yes, I think I did that twice, I apologize. What am I doing wrong? Okay, oh, here we go. Here is another scenario. Your Kiwanis Club is hosting their annual pancake fundraiser and you ask Key Club students to help serve. Um, and you say yes or false. Every Kiwanian present must have a clear background check. Any answers? Shout it out in the chat. <laughs> mm. False. False. The event is not an official youth sponsored or SLP sponsored event. It's the club event, it's the adults. Um, so not all Kiwanians are considered chaperones for this example. Um, as we move ahead, talking about culture of care. Um, so this is kind of transitioning into, so the background checks and the training are for the advisors and those adults who are working with youth. And then we transition into culture of care and building that environment for youth um, at their meetings, at their events, at their service projects. And one of the areas that we have heard feedback from, as I said earlier, about anxiety and depression and stress um, is mental health. And so some of the things that we have been doing to work in that area, um, Michelle, as long as our Key Club, TKI, and some Kiwanis had um, a lunch with a leader, a mental health Q&A, and they spoke with Anthem's um, director of the psychiatry, Dr. Jessica Chandre, and she was able to answer questions that the students had, kind of a one-on-one, -on -one, and that you can actually look at that and find it on our Kiwanis International Facebook page if you're interested and you want to go back or if you want to even um, look at it for your local clubs and go back as a resource. Um, recently, the CKI, the college, um, Circle K International has partnered with Active Minds. And Active Minds is a US uh, premier nonprofit organization focusing on mental health awareness and education for young adults. Um, and it's typically the, the 14 to 25 year olds and they have chapters across the nation at different college campuses. So we're gonna be working with them. They already presented at the CKI Next uh, conference and we're gonna be working with them to do some more training, to more resources for our college, uh, our college members. And then for Key Club, we have, as part of the four workshops that were presented at the Summer Leadership Program, or the Summer Leadership Conference, um, we are working on a culture of care champions, so a certification. So if students actually review the four workshops, they can become culture of care champions and take that information back to their clubs. 
and we're working with our trainer to, he's developed a facilitator guide, a train the trainer. So that was actually one of the last sessions and how that the students could take these practices of self-care and of empathy back into their clubs and how students can be facilitators of positive change in their communities as leaders. And we're hoping to meet with the cohorts throughout the school year. Um, so you might hear more about that, or if you have any students who are interested in that, um, definitely reach out to me and we can get them more information. Another thing that, um, that we've recently done in January, we launched a 1-800 number. So it is an anonymous helpline and it is staffed 24 hours, seven days a week by Presidium trained professionals who are, it's like a, a crisis helpline. It can be for reporting abuse. It could be reporting Kiwanis policy violations or inappropriate behavior. Um, so far we've, knock on wood, we've only had two calls and they have been more on the Kiwanis policy, um, possibly inappropriate behavior, not anything of urgent nature or of abuse. Um, each of the calls then are routed to the youth protection team as well as our general counsel. And then we investigate and we ask questions and we'll reach out to that uh, key club advisor or that DA um, and kind of look into what the scenario is. But as I said so far, we've been fortunate enough um, that there haven't been any abuse cases, but part of creating a culture of care is we want students to know that if they um, need to report abuse, that there's an anonymous helpline that they can. And so we're gonna be doing um, promotion, um, promoting it in our social media. You might see it in our newsletters coming up in the next month. Yeah, and every month on the 9th, which goes along with Title IX protections, um, at least our colleges, we promoting this on the 9th of every month across all of our club lines so that eventually people begin to, at a minimum, know where they can find that phone number and, and hopefully begin to memorize that number if they should ever need it. So at this point, we will open it up to questions. If anyone has questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. Larry talks about the difference of a background check for Homeland Security versus this. <laughs> absolutely correct. Uh, Larry, yes, it does take a little bit more time for that. And particularly if you've lived more life. Um, so our checks fall under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, that uh, background checks cannot go back further than 10 years. Um, in some states it's seven, but we maintain a 10 year as our policy. Um, so they, they, aren't, they don't take the months that perhaps you've experienced, Larry, um, except for during COVID-19 when um, government, county government records are, uh, people are gone and, and not working or, or they're working remotely and they don't have access to everything. So uh, that has slowed us down a bit, but we're working through it. Um, each case we're taking, case, you know, handling uniquely. All right, who's got questions? Come on, Will. Uh, we haven't seen any questions on Facebook or in the chat, but I did just want to say thank you to uh, both Michelle and Melissa for joining us this evening. Um, youth protection is an incredibly important topic for us to talk about. Um, it's not always the uh, you know shiny uh, workshop on the schedule, um, but it's not um, something that we can neglect. And I think the statistics that Melissa shared earlier about uh, the number of especially key club advisors, Kiwanis advisors to key clubs who do not have an up-to-date background check really shows that, that we need to make sure to pay attention to this topic. Uh, background checking the people who work with youth is literally the least that we can do as Kiwanians to make sure that our youth are safe. So, you know, we need to do that. That's not an option. It's, you know, it's a form, you fill it out, it takes five minutes you pay 25 bucks, your Kiwanis Club reimburses you for it. So um, we really need to make sure that that is part of the expectation for all of our Kiwanis advisors. Um, and um, I know Brian and I are both uh, trying to crack down on people who, who aren't doing that. 
Um, we are but, into, sorry, hey, Will, to, to, hi, how are you? To piggyback on what Will's saying, um, I know not everybody wants to be, but it really makes it sense to have all Kiwanians background check. Because at some point, you're all going to wor work with children, um, or at least expect to work with children, um, you know, or be a chaperone at some point. And it just makes sense, you know, to, to get everybody on board with that and get those numbers up. You know, that's something we see growing every single year is the number of KI clubs that now require 100% of their membership to have a background check. Um, and we see that number, it was like 100 a couple years ago, now it's up over 200. So again, I realize we have like five, 10,000 clubs, but um, it's growing every year. And I think that uh, this is the new normal. I had, uh, my daughter started kindergarten last year. She does sports, we worked at Kiwanis. I had five different background checks. Um, I went through about five different organizations, uh, youth protection training, the Archdiocese, Kiwanis, uh, Boy Scouts. I have sh helped chaperone something for my nephew. Like, you have to do it. And, um, oh, the background checks, Bob, are good for two years. Um, and then someone on the chat indicated they just got their uh, background check. So thank you. And I think in addition to that, the culture of care pieces that International is putting out are, are incredibly important. And I think it's, you know, as adults who work with key clubbers, especially, um, and, and builders club students and, and Circle K as well, you know, these kids are, are going through a lot. Um, you know, I think we've all seen uh, an increase in the number of students who, who report having various mental health challenges, um, partially because it's more prevalent and partially because they're more comfortable talking about it than mm -hmm. past generations. But, you know, it's really important that, that we provide them with the resources. You know, we're not counselors, but to be able to send them in the right direction um, is incredibly important. So I thank Kiwanis International for really taking some leadership in that area as well. Um, but you. I think with that, if we- We got a question from Bob. We got a question from Bob Wiley. How long is a background check good for? Two years. Right. I'll type them back. Will, Will and Melissa. Melissa, this is Lamit Bailey. Hi, nice to meet you. We, ha <laughs> we had some technical issues. So yeah. I'm glad that you got it. Yeah, it is a little bit trickier in other, in non-US countries. So thank you for working as hard as you did to get yours done. Yes, I'm glad that I've met you at last. Yes, absolutely. I, I must say that um, the thorough background check is worthwhile. So I do applaud Kiwanis for what they are doing in that regard. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent. So I think with that, I will end uh, the live stream and in about five minutes, we will start our third workshop of the evening. So thank you to our presenters tonight. Bye everyone. Thank you for not have making us the last one. Yeah, have a nice <laughs> evening.